one since uh, I got 10.01. Um, well, I see everybody must turn the clocks up because we're all here. <laughs> Jerry Stilwell used to tell me, he said, uh, he had so many clocks to turn up in his house, he always missed one. And he never had the right time on any of them. So. She, uh, Glenna's got a, uh, a charger that charges her Apple Watch and her, uh, her, her phone in the bedroom. So yesterday I turned it up an hour, and this morning it was two hours ahead. I guess it, sets it, it does itself. It's one of those things that does itself. I, anyway, one of those things. All right. Ready to go this morning. All right, let's see. Well, I forgot to put my pen in my pocket this morning. That'll work if it'll write. Uh. All right, uh, Mr. Finley, how's your uh, your brother's wife doing? Is that? She passed away. Oh, uh, when? Oh my goodness. I already heard that. Okay. Okay. I just remember that family. That was kind of expected since you've been saying she's been in hospice. Okay. All right. All right. Anyone else? Have a Now, her, who? Uh, Kim. Uh, did you say Tessie? Hussie. Okay. 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 And someone your wife knew what you were. Okay. Oh, okay. That's M A M A G D E L I. Her last name was what? Lambeth. Lambeth, okay, got you. And she's your aunt, okay. And that family. Let's go, Lord, in prayer and ask him to bless our time together this morning. Father, with grateful hearts, Lord, we're here this morning, Lord, for Bible study and for worship. And, Lord, for the time that we share together, sharing one another's needs, we just pray that you'd be with us this morning and touch all these needs, Lord, in a special way for, for, for uh, Finley's brother's family, Lord. We just uh, pray that you'd uh, comfort them in this time of loss. And, Lord, for Finley and Joanne, too, as well, we just pray that you'd uh, comfort that entire family, Lord, in, in, in the only way that you possibly can. And, Lord, for Kim Hussey, we pray that you'd, uh, you'd touch her in a special way this day. And, and Lord, uh, for uh, the family of uh, Magdalene Lambus, uh, as Sherry mentioned, we just uh, pray that, Lord, that you'd just comfort that family. Lord, you, you alone can, Lord, provide the comfort as needed in time of loss. And, Lord, we just... Uh, Pray that you do just that, Lord, and be just very real to this, these families, Lord, that struggle and deal with these uh, with loss. Loss of loved ones is never an easy 
for any of us, Lord, we all of us have dealt with that at some time or another in our lives. And Lord, we just pray that you just special touch on all of those, Lord, as we share this time together. Thank you for all that you do for us. Bless our lesson today. Bless our pastors that brings our message. And just ask you to bless all that takes place this day that you might receive all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. All right. You recall from last uh, lesson today is in 1 Thessalonians. Paul Finley gave us a good introduction on this last time. 1 Thessalonians, this, is called, this one is called Shared. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And uh, um, Read off here with just verses one and two. It says, For yourselves, brethren, know our our interest unto you that is our that he, now Paul is, is with Timothy and Silas. In other words, when he when he refers to we or ours, he's talking about that's the group of the friends that together do this. Now know our interest unto you that it was not in vain. Now, they were, they were there a very short time, probably three or four weeks, probably at the most, before a riot was stirred up in, there in Thessalonica and cut short his visit. Now, so, but a lot accomplished in that. In that short length of time, he had established a real core of believers. He started a church by preaching there in the synagogue. That's what he did everywhere he went. Uh, Paul would just first place he'd go, synagogues and priests. And first thing you know, the, the rioters would come and then they'd have to run him off and leave and he'd have to escape and go somewhere else. But he never gave up. You talk about keeping on, keeping on. That was uh, sort of his hallmark there. He said, our naughty was in vain, but even after that we had suffered before and shamefully treated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our, our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with such Contention. Boy, that was contention. Um, they had left Philippi. Let's see. You, you need to read chapters 16 and 17 of Acts. It tells all this stuff about their visit, about their stay in Philippi and their imprisonment there. You remember where the, where the where they were singing the hymns at midnight and the earthquake broke, broke all the doors open and the, and the jailer come in there and said he was the Said they thought they was all gone. He's going to kill himself, and uh, because they had all the prisoners escaped, Paul said, "No, we're all here." And uh, wound up, it felt, the jailer and his family got saved. But all that took place before they got to Thessalonica. And but read chapters 16 and 17 of Acts. It tells all the story of all this and, and his stay in Thessalonica too, and where he left after there. When the riot took place in the uh, Thessalonica, he had to leave there and went somewhere else. So everywhere he went, they they had the jails ready for him and contention. But he uh, he was all, he never he he carried out faithfully what God told him to do: preach to the Gentiles. That's what he did. Now you have to keep in mind too that this in this pagan culture that these people come from, um, they were. It was, they had never heard anything even approaching God. They didn't even know Jesus existed. Well, it wasn't either. I didn't either, before I got saved. Never give a thought to God about what I was doing or how he had in my life. But then these people hadn't. That's the way it is before you're saved. Unless you, you know, if you're brought up in a church before you're saved, you probably heard a lot of these things. You've heard Bible studies and you've heard stories and things like that. But see, uh, I didn't. And these people here and there, they'd never heard, even heard of these things. So they received it willingly and readily because it, didn't, because it, was, a, it was good news. And it says, Philippi, where we're, we're bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with such much contention. Contention is certainly right in that area, wasn't it? Paul's adversaries had parked their right in, in Thessalonica and accused missionaries of treason against Caesar. Well, that was one of the ways they used to, to accuse him of. He's preaching another God besides another God besides Caesar. 
Caesar was a worship as a god in those days, which they needed to. It says if Paul and his friends had withered under the attacks of their enemies, they may never have heard the good news. He had to endure and keep on going, doing what he was doing. Otherwise, they never would have heard. Verses 3 and 4. For our exhortation or our encouragements was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. In other words, he never defied to fool anybody. He was what he was. But as we were allowed by God, by God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God was trieth our hearts. You know, it's, it's the God, God entrusts us with his, his message. He trusted Paul. He entrusts us with the same message. We have the gospel message with us, and God wants us to share it, that message. And it's, it, it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of amazing in a way how God puts us, allows us to do his work for him. He has no other, if we don't do it, it's not going to get done. There is no plan B. We have, we have the gospel in, in us to, to share, and that's, that's what we have to do. For our exhortation was not deceit or uncleanness. It was not, uh, it was nothing, it was marked by integrity. It was important to remember that their message came with a proper motive. He wasn't out to gain anything at all. He just shared the gospel message. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even as we speak, not pleasing men, he wasn't out to please anybody. He wasn't out to, to win friends and influence people. He put, he put it out just like it was, and if it, uh, and if it was uh, offensive, then so be it. God's Word is offensive to some people. They don't want to hear it because they know they need it, and they don't reject it, and they're going to reject that. Paul told the unvarnished truth. He didn't hold nothing back, hold it just like it was, uh, about his death, burial, and resurrection, which is the gospel. That is the gospel message, death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what God called him to do, and he did it faithfully. Without any ulterior motives or anything at all about it at all. Paul told the unvarnished truth about Jesus' death, burial, and rest. This is what God called him to do. Since Paul focused on God's approval, he refused to stray from the truth of the gospel. His goal was to reveal God's plan of salvation, even if some did not appreciate his honest assessment of the human race or need for a savior. That's what, that's what, he, that's what a lot of people reject it because of pride. They don't want to feel like they need it. Honest assessment. Well, if you want honest assessment about our condition, you need no go further than what? Than the Bible. We're born sinners. We don't have anything, anything to go in for us whatsoever. We're all sinners to the core. We have no righteousness of our own at all. There's nothing good about us. Now, somebody might buy stupid that. Well, I'm not a bad person. Well, compared to somebody else, you might not be. But you compare yourself to Lord Jesus and see where you stand up. Nobody likes to be told they're bad. You don't like to tell somebody, and nobody wants to be told that they're bad, that they're sinners. That's one of the reasons that uh, they reject it. See. Paul's focus on God's, even if some did not appreciate his honest assessment. Still, the apostle remained unfazed by opposition. His goal was pleasing, not pleasing men, but God. He wasn't trying to make friends. He was trying to preach the gospel. Wherever, however it landed. So he was ob ob obligated to preach the message he had received without altering it. God had called him, and God was the one who tries our hearts, he said. He didn't change it. You can't change God's word into something that you more uh, acceptable. He said. That's been done a lot to these days. Make it, make it sound, sound like, make it, change it around where it sounds good, and people will receive it. You can't do that. It is what it is. Five and six says this. For neither at any time we use flattering words, <laughs> as you know, nor a 
cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Not of men we sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, which might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. He didn't try to win. He didn't try to use guile or, or false words or things that made you, like I said, to, to, to make it more acceptable. It says other preachers would say whatever the crowd wanted to hear in order to get more money or fees. Now, he's going to talk a little bit about money here in a little bit, how he did it, how he did all this work, you know, without any kind of trying to be a burden on anybody. But yeah, you hear a lot of that today. You can hear that today. What the Timothy said, you, people will, the time will come when people will, will have itching ears, wanting to hear what they want to hear, and want to be told, and they'll have the plenty of people to tell it to them. It's going to happen, and probably already is. Tell them what they want to hear. Then you can charge them, take big offerings. Paul never sought money, you know, he never altered the message. By the way, that verse is in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 that I talked about. About people wanting itchy ears. Just as he did not try to profit financially from his work, Paul also left his reputation in God's hands. Seeking glory for himself would only distract others from seeing the one who deserves all the glory, Christ Jesus. Paul, I wondered about myself this. Um, Paul did a lot of traveling. All those missionary journeys he went. He had, I had to ask myself, how did, he, how did he buy that? How did he afford all that? Who paid his way? Well, he probably got a lot of donations. And he worked, of course, too. He's a tent maker. He worked to get a little money, and, and God provides for people who want to do his work. You might say, how in the world did he make all them travel? He, back then, I know it was probably cheap, but they went on, on boats when it was uh, on, on, land, on, ship, on water. But now on land, they went by what? Camels and donkeys and that kind of stuff. That's all the thing they had. There weren't no Ubers back then. But now all that costs money, and he had to eat, too. So but God will make sure you, if you want to decide you want to decide to try to do God's work, he'll provide the means to do it. But I, I thought about that as I studied for this lesson. I know what did he manage to finance all that traveling, and he did. But he did. God made provision for him. Verse 7 says, But we were gentle among you, even as more... A nurse cherishes cherish her, her children. He compares himself to a, a mother nursing a, a mother who taking care of children. Paul and his friends could have been a burden to the Thessalonica in verse 6. Now they did have, and this is such a thing as this, that, that apostles, they do, preachers, they do have an authority, have a, a authority, he could have demanded, okay, you pay, you pay my expenses. I'm here preaching you the gospel. You pay my expenses. He could have done that. They could have used their authority to request financial support from the church without any conflict of conscience. They could have done that. He chose not to do that. He said Paul often distinguished between what he had a right to do as an apostle and what was best for others. Now, he did that on more than one occasion, not just financially. He did it in, 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 in any kind of thing that he thought would cause somebody else to stumble. He wouldn't do it. He said, if meat caused my brother to stumble, I won't eat no meat as long as the world remains. I don't know what, where that's at, but he just said that was one of Paul's saying. He wanted to be, make sure that nobody would felt obligated to, to, to him at, in, in, under any circumstances. That way they couldn't say, well, okay, you're just doing this for the money. If they couldn't say that about Paul because he did it for free. For the most part. And I said, God will provide for you if you do his work. And that's what he did for Paul. Verse 8. So being affectionately desirous of you, that's affectionate. So your word is pretty strong. It means sort of a, a, a deep love for him. And it was. He, everywhere he went, people could sense that he loved them and, had, and, and wanted to do what was the best for them. I've heard it said this, is that people don't, uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's what makes the difference. 
people understand whether you're the, where, how, where you are coming from as far as whether you care for them or not. Are you there just to, to fill an obligation? Are you there because you're being asked to? Or, you, or, or, or do you have a desire, a sincere love in the, for the people that you're ministering to? They know that. People can sense that. And they, they can sense it with him. Paul and his friends were willing to share the gospel with them. The verb used here could also be translated delighted. In other words, he's will, he's, he, he, he sincerely wanted to. It was his desire. It was above, above it was immediate, all that thing, that's what he really wanted to do. Paul, Silas, and Timothy became personally involved with and attached to their brothers and sisters in Thessalonica. They became a family, just like we're a family here. Um, I think it was at the uh, Baptist men's meeting tonight, said uh, uh, Jim Darling said uh, he felt like he's family. I said, well, yeah, you are a family. <laughs> this is a church family. We all, we share one another's burdens. We share one another's joys. When, every, and when one of us has something good happen, we all are pleased. When something bad happens, we're all right there with it to stand with them. It's a family, just like your family at home. Church family. God's family, brothers and sisters, all in this together. And we can't do it alone. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. You can't be one. You have to have support and prayers of your other fellow brothers and sisters. It just doesn't work any other way. It's a struggle if you try to do, it by, do these things by yourself. They become they become dear to him. The bond they shared in Christ was strong, so personal sacrifice was really no sacrifice at all. Simply a reasonable part of their ministry, they said. And finally, verses 9 and 12. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable to any one of you, we preached you the gospel. You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves. Among you that believe. In other words, they, were, they tried to keep themselves absolutely morally clear. Not, and because people, uh, people know how you, are, how you act. And they're around you. Um, the Great Commission says what? It says, it says, you shall be witnesses. Well, you can't avoid being a witness. You're a witness every time you step out the door. The people are going to be looking and watching if you don't live out what we say we live when we're out among other people, they notice. In other words, if you say, you know, we're witness, witnesses whether we want to be or not. Whether we're good ones or bad ones, it's, uh, it's our choice, you see. Paul and his friends worked hard because they refused to be a burden, as we talked about before. Their commitment to raising their own financial support ran contrary to the typical practices of first century teachers. As I said, false teachers were abundant in those days and they are today. And they tell you anything you want to hear as long as you pay them. They didn't want to be a burden and they wouldn't. And they weren't. Made me absolutely sure of that. They acted holily, godly, justly. He didn't cut any corners in his talk. His walk matched the talk. I guess that's a good, good way to put it. We've heard that, all heard that before. Your witnesses, and God also have boldly and justly, we unblameably behaved ourselves. And ye know how we exhorted or, com or encouraged and comforted and charged every one of you, all of you, as a father does his children. Wow, that's pretty good acknowledge, isn't it? Just like a, a father encourages and, and, and treats his children. That's how he tried to do it all of those, the ones he ministered to. And it was real. That's what you have to be when you're, when you're a Christian. You have to be real. You have to be what you say you are and act it out. That ye walk worthy of the God who called you into his kingdom and glory. The church's testimony of, in a pagan culture hinged upon an accurate demonstration of Christ through their lives and words. Just as Paul had lived a blameless life among them, they needed to live beyond reproach too. And they did. They had a sincere faith. 
And you, as we're going to see in the next, in the next couple of lessons, they, it not only with them, they, it spread all over the, they, incur, they had influence all the way around them. They were sincere. Paul preached a sincere gospel, and he preached it to sincere Christians who knew. You see, they, they, it was, the reason they were able to accept this message is because they saw what he, what he had been through. What he, how he suffered in places that he'd been. They said, okay, this guy's real. He wouldn't went through all this if what he's preaching is not real. He wouldn't have suffered all this and still come and done it to, for us if he wasn't real, if his message wasn't real. And it kind of, and, and it helps people to know, you know, that, that where you've been where they are. We can relate to people who, who've been where we are. And it makes, it, 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 it really makes a positive effect on the message they preach. So, so Paul had a good message there. He wasn't there very long, but he established a solid, small church who, who just who grew. Kept growing and affected the an area around them. Did a good job. You want to have any questions or anything you want to add, boy? All right, let's dismiss for prayer. Father, we thank you for this lesson today. It teaches us, Lord, that uh, when we're around other people, Lord, we have to be the real. We have to be the people we claim to be, just as Paul was. He was never... He was always uh, real and genuine in all that he did. He never compromised the message at all, but always preached it solidly and completely and, and purely and accurately, just as God had given him the message. Let us, let us do the same, Lord, as we are around people that we know, that we know that need that gospel message. Bless our time together this day. Bless our passage. Our pastor, Lord, as he brings the message later this day, we just ask you to bless all that takes place. And I, before we ask it all in Christ's name, amen. I'm going to move this podium over to her for her so she can, she's going to need.